Hello, and welcome. I'm Daughter of Darkness, your narrator. Darkness and danger are not bound by age and gender, as we will see in tonight's stories. Both men and women can be abductors, and they prey on people of any age. They can be found anywhere and everywhere, so you can never fully let your guard down. Let me remind you to join me here every Thursday at 5 p.m. for the weekly party. I'll entertain you while teaching you through these stories how to stay safe so that we can all keep meeting here every week. So for now, sit back, relax, let me lead the way, and let's get scared together, together, together. Through the years, as a woman who has declined every proposal of marriage or conventional living arrangement, largely moving through life as a single female, I have gathered more tales of dangerous chance encounters than I can even rattle off in a day. But my earliest memory of contact with a predator predates the invention of the internet when I was just a child living with my also very single mother. We had just moved into a large colonial-style home across the street from the daycare center where I went. It was the nicest home we had ever lived in, which was saying a lot because my mother was forever struggling to keep me clothed and fed. My father did pay child support, but at the time, he was a struggling artist. He did eventually become very successful, but at the time, he couldn't pay a lot in child support. I was excited because I was given the entire main level to myself to serve as my own personal play palace, away from my chronically high-strung mother. And she was relieved to be directly across the street from reliable childcare. We had some very interesting neighbors. To the right were the Moonies, members of the cult known as the Unification Movement. A group of them lived in an upscale house a stone's throw away with shuttered windows that never opened, and we almost never laid eyes on them. Never during the daytime. Never, ever. And to the left was Ron. Ron was a middle-aged man, in his 40s and a little more than a decade older than my mother. I was seven at the time and pretty observant for a child, so it didn't escape my notice that Ron was eccentric. He was always wound up and kind of dopey at the same time. He had wild, dark hair that stuck up and kind of fanned out on the sides, but he was thinning on top. He wore wire rim glasses that magnified his eyes and somehow lent him an air of goofy harmlessness, like the fourth missing stooge. When we first met Ron, who just appeared in our front yard one afternoon after my mother collected me from daycare, my mother's weirdometer went off. He seemed over-eager to be living next door to a financially strapped single mother and her young daughter. My mother was a beauty by any standards. Tall, willowy, with long blonde hair that hung to her waist and always the perfect shade of tan, thanks to her Native American grandparents who helped raise her. Just a really striking and unusually beautiful woman but troubled. She was troubled for a lot of cultural reasons, which left her socially awkward and gun-shy, but also very sympathetic to other socially awkward individuals. So she gave Ron the benefit of the doubt. I thought that Ron had just developed a very big crush on her, and understandably so. It all started with a locket, a locket which held a picture of me inside of it. This was the first gift that he surprised her with, calling up to the house while standing outside of our fence. It looked like an antique to us, which Ron confirmed it was. He said he came across it at work. He was an antiques dealer. My mother was deeply disturbed by the photo of me, which was obviously taken unbeknownst to anyone while I was playing in the front yard. Back then, everything was done with 35 millimeter film no one had cell phones, or home printers, or even disposable cameras. 
we had Polaroid and 35 millimeter. And this was 35 millimeter, meaning that there were likely other photos of me which he had taken, developed, and had sitting in his home. My mother tried to refuse the gift, explaining that she was not by any means okay with anyone taking photos of her daughter without her consent. But then, Ron appeared to be inconsolably apologetic, so she accepted it, reluctantly thanked him, and we both went back inside. The next gift was a large stereo system. Stereo systems were not cheap in those days, and this was one of the more expensive models. Ron, who always looked especially sweaty and sickly in the Texas heat, said he received it from a pawn shop owner that he was friendly with. He said he already had a home stereo, as well as one at the antique shop, so he didn't need it and thought we could use it. He was right. We only had a little boom box. Well, I had one. My mother had books in her writing. She eschewed all other forms of entertainment as brain rotting. My mother refused the extravagant gift, but Ron begged her to take it for my sake. And finally, she relented, but it made her incredibly uncomfortable. She said at least she could listen to Tina Turner, of whom she was quite the fan. And she also took Ron's suggestion that she set the system up downstairs in my den. The third gift was a camera, an obviously expensive and professional camera, which he again claimed he received from a friend. But none of these items looked used by any means, and my mother really wanted the attention to stop at that point. So she flatly refused the gift and drew her line in the sand. No more gifts. None. Period. She began dreading coming home from work, and I was no longer allowed to play out in the yard. Despite the absence of gifts, Ron would still appear at the fence or catch my attention under the window. I would instinctively go get my mother, who would come down and firmly but politely tell him that it was not a good time for a visit and send him away. Around this time, my mother and father had begun working out a new visitation schedule, and I was to begin spending Saturday nights at my father's house. Up to that point, I would spend Fridays there. That first Saturday went very smoothly, until the following Sunday morning, when my father returned me to my mother's house and we discovered that someone had broken in, taken nothing, and gone nowhere except the main level. My mother heard the intruder come in and quietly locked the door at the top of the stairs and hid until she heard him leave some minutes later. It was lucky that I had been away at the time because it was typical for me to be up late on Saturday nights listening to the stereo alone in my den. The police told my mother that she needed to get a dog and a gun. She took off work the next day and I stayed another night with my father while she went shopping for a gun. At some point, while talking to my father about the incident, the matter of the neighbors came up and Ron entered the conversation. When my father learned about all the attention Ron had fixated on my mother, he was naturally alarmed, especially for me, whom he worried might get caught in the crosshairs. My dad was kind of a vaguely emotionally unavailable man, but not an absentee father by any means. And I knew, beneath his somewhat distant, placid surface, he loved me greatly. My mother would later tell me about the duality of his personality. He was soft-hearted in many ways, taking in a stray dog or cat, but you didn't want to cross him. He would come home from the bars covered in other people's blood if there was a dust-up. He had been a boxer for many years in the service, and he was unafraid of people even if they were people that should have been avoided. I guess you'd call my father something of a wild card. You never knew what you would get when push came to shove. A week or two went by and I began noticing Ron walking by my school often during recess. He'd stop and say hi, which no one seemed to notice. 
I didn't mention it to my parents because I didn't really understand the true concept of child predators at that age, and because Ron never engaged me beyond saying hello or waving as he walked along the fence. Finally, one day, he stopped at the fence and said, I'm going to get some ice cream. It's so hot out. Aren't you hot? It was Houston, Texas. Even as a child born and raised there, I knew it was hot, often dangerously so. So, uh, yeah, I was hot. I nodded yes. I really wish I could take you to get some ice cream with me, he said, sticking his fingers through the chain link fence. Hey, he exclaimed, as though he had just suddenly had a brilliant idea. You want to go get some ice cream with me? That was a defining moment in my child's brain, when it became something other than simply the mind of a child. I understood then that Ron was not Crazy Ron, as my parents had been calling him. He was sinister, and his intentions were dark, darker than I could fathom, but I seemed to snap to the awareness in that moment. Up until that point, We'd been warned what adults who sought to hurt children would say to lure us away from safety. It was all over television commercials, and police and guest speakers visiting our school would recite the script of lines meant to tempt us away with promises of pixie sticks and bubble gum. But they never told us what happened after that. What would they actually do if we took the bait? But in that moment, I didn't need to know. An uneasy feeling crept over me, and I backed away from the fence, saying I needed to go. Recess was almost over. About an hour later, I was called to the principal's office. I was terrified, as I'd never been called down to the office before. I was a pretty well-behaved kid, so when I walked in and saw both of my parents there, my stomach dropped. My mother was visibly shaken, and my father was pacing. I had only seen my father angry one time that I could recall, yet I knew in my gut he was seething with anger. I knew I was really in trouble if both my mother and father had been called away from their respective jobs to deal with something that I had done. But for the life of me, I couldn't figure out what I had done. I quickly learned that Ron had gone to the school's office earlier, stating that he was my father, and that he was there to pick me up, and we would be promptly moving to another state, so I wouldn't be returning. Luckily, my father was a very involved parent, and he was also friends with the artist boyfriend of the teacher that I had at the time, Miss Curry, and she knew what my father looked like. When she received word that my father was there to whisk me away for good, she went straight to the principal's office to learn more. The man standing before her was clearly not my father, and the staff's internal alarm bells went off. The police had already taken Ron away, and I'm not really sure what happened next, but I do know that at some point in the days that followed, Ron returned home briefly long enough for my father to find him. Unfortunately, my father is no longer living, so he can't fill in the blanks of the story. But I do remember that he came home from Ron's house, looking flustered and holding one hand in the other and wincing. He also told us that Ron wouldn't be living next door any longer, and if we ever saw a trace of him again, that my father would kill him with his bare hands. He then took me to his house for several days, and when I returned home, Ron was gone, and the police continued to move in and out of his house for the rest of the week. There were no stalking laws at that time in Texas, and even kidnapping was a fairly new concept for law enforcement, and they had limited protocols in place. This was in the 1980s, from what I've been able to piece together is that eventually the police were able to tie Ron to the break-in at my mother's house, 
where he had likely gone clumsily planning to abduct me. And whatever they found in his house was enough to keep him behind bars. Ron was an inept oaf in almost all ways, though I think he did have flashes of real cunning. I think the suggestion to my mother that the stereo system be placed downstairs for me, where I could almost always be found listening to music alone, was very calculated. The garage is right off that room, and the garage itself butted up to his property. If we ever made the mistake of leaving the garage door unlocked, he could have simply entered undetected over the sound of the music. We also learned that Ron had been living with his mother, Norman Bates style, his entire life, until she died not long before we moved in, leaving him the house next to us and the antique shop. Suffice it to say, Ron was not a well-balanced functioning adult. The part that makes me really uneasy is Ron's plan to move with me in tow. I couldn't imagine that he was actually planning to abandon the home that he owned. I don't know if he was simply being impulsive, thinking that he would work out the kinks after he got me into his clutches, or if he already had some terrible plan to dispose of me and the evidence before I was officially declared missing. My mother bought a German Shepherd violating the terms of our lease, so we had to move to a tiny apartment above a garage across town, so we never saw Ron again. Hopefully, no one outside of his fellow prisoners did, but I suspect he was eventually released back into society at some point. But who knows? I doubt he's even alive in 2020. I suppose the most frightening aspect of this whole thing for me is that my mother was never the target, only the obstacle. All the flattery and attempts to infiltrate her life were simply the acts of a man trying to get around her to get to her child. Sometimes you need some levity in between courses of darkness. Here's our palate cleanser. I was almost abducted as a kid, and I didn't even realize it. This happened in the late 90s when I was seven. I was playing by myself in the front yard, and at some point a portly fellow driving a crusty dark blue van pulled up to me, and in an overly familiar tone, explained that his dog had run away and that he really needed my help to track him down. He even pulled out a printed sheet of paper with a blown-up photograph of a dog printed out on it. I, being the living embodiment of those kidnapping PSA ads, not only trusted and believed him, but I was super pumped that I could actually help find a dog. I loved my dog, and I knew I would appreciate it if somebody helped me find him if he escaped from my yard, so hell yeah I'll get in your van. Thankfully, my stupid self thought to tell my mom real fast what I was doing, not even as a precaution. I was just so excited, I wanted to tell her that I was going to help find a puppy. I'll be right back. I'm going to go tell my mom, I told him. As I turned around and started running towards my house, he began yelling at me and told me that we didn't have time. Hurry up, get in the van. I told him I would just be quick, but before I could even get to the porch, he drove off. Well, that was weird, I thought, but I never brought it up to my parents and pretty much forgot about the whole thing. Fast forward to a few years ago, some co-workers and I were talking about weird stuff that we'd experienced as kids, and that memory just popped into my head. It took about a millisecond to connect the dots and realize what almost went down, followed by a knowing, oh. In retrospect, I should have told my mom about it, and hopefully he never tried that with another kid, but that's just not realistic. 
Not the craziest story, but I figured it was worth putting out there. My sister and I are very close in age, but she's like the buttercup to my bubbles. So my parents would always let her walk alone, but not me. I always protested the perceived unfairness of it all. So eventually, my dad decided to test me, to show me why I wasn't allowed to walk alone. He asked me if I would walk off alone with a strange man. Of course I said no. He then asked, well, what if he lost his dog? And I enthusiastically said, yes. And there you have it. That is why this woman was not allowed to walk alone until age 35. And now back to the darkness. I used to work with a guy. He was a single guy, early 30s, and not socially awkward by any means. He was just a regular, everyday, fun guy to work with and to hang out with outside of work. He used to come by every once in a while to have dinner and a beer or two with the wife and I. He also liked talking to my kids, aged seven and three at the time. He told me about how he envied me and wished he had a wife and kids of his own. Nothing about this guy set off any alarm bells at all. One day, he just up and vanished. I feared the worst because mutual friends either didn't know what happened, or they would just say, his family is requesting privacy at this time. Six months later, out of the blue, he wrote us a letter from jail, claiming that he was innocent and that his roommate framed him, blah, blah, blah. He had been charged with 15 counts of child molestation. That hit me like a ton of bricks. There were a couple of occasions where he'd had a few too many and he ended up using our guest room instead of going home for the night. Did he touch my kids? Was he grooming them for the future? How the hell was I going to ask my kids this horrible question? Obviously, we did ask and thankfully nothing happened. My kids are now 19 and 15, and still to this day, the hardest thing I ever did as a parent was having to ask that question, and then having to explain to them that monsters are real, but they don't look like monsters or hide under the bed. They look like us, and they hide in plain sight. This happened about two years ago. I was hanging out with my friend Ivana at a bar. It was around 9 p.m. and we were just chatting and having a few drinks. She was telling me about some guy that she'd been talking to on Tinder. She showed me his photos. His name was Omar and he seemed pretty attractive. They'd been talking for a few days but hadn't yet met. She tried several times to get him to text her outside of the app but he would give her the same excuse. I don't want to give my number out to a stranger that I haven't met yet. It was a bit unusual, but totally understandable. So I told her he was just being smart. At that point, she looked down at her phone and she squealed, Oh my God, Omar wants to meet. I told her to go ahead, it would be okay, and she could leave if she wanted to. She said, Oh, he wants me to come over to his house. I immediately said, Oh, hell no. She seemed to agree and continued to respond to Omar. I was now very hesitant to leave because part of me was scared that she would change her mind and go to his place once I left. I told her, tell him to meet you at the hookah bar across the street. She thought it would be weird to meet him with me along. So I told her, I'd head over there after her 
and act like we didn't know one another and just sit across the room, keeping an eye out. She said okay and left. It was now 10.20 p.m., and it had been about 15 minutes since she'd left, so I proceeded to go across the street. I entered the hookah bar and ordered a blueberry mint hookah. I looked around trying to find them, and I saw her sitting at a table closest to the door, across from Omar. I sat at a table across from them and started smiling. I found this whole thing very entertaining. I had a great view of her face and his back. Ivana seemed to be very happy and laughing while she was talking to him. It was really cute. I got my hookah and I just sat there playing with my phone. I was texting my boyfriend telling him what was going on. While I was mid-typing, I got a text from Ivana. Amy, I don't know about this. I looked up and I saw her face. She seemed pretty uncomfortable. Being the nosy-ass friend that I am, I typed back, what's wrong? She answered, he keeps asking me to come home with him. I smirked and responded, oh, so he's trying to get some. She didn't look at her phone for a couple of minutes, and I saw her stand up. She smiled and nodded and headed towards the bathroom, and from the bathroom, she called me. Amy, I need to leave now. The smile disappeared from my face, and I started to worry. She seemed genuinely scared. She continued, He asked me like ten times to come over, and when I kept saying no, he laughed and said, Don't make me kidnap you. He's probably joking, but I don't know. I said, Yeah, he's probably joking, but that's still pretty creepy. Amy, what do I do? I was about to answer her when I saw Omar get up and walk over towards the bathroom. I thought he was just going to the men's room, but that's when things got really weird. He stopped right outside of the ladies' room and put his ear to the door. Ivana, don't say anything. He's right outside the door. At this point, I knew there was something definitely wrong about this guy, and we needed to get out of there fast. He took his ear off the door and went to sit back down at the table. I reassured my friend that things were going to be okay because I was there with her and we'd leave soon. Ivana came out of the bathroom shortly after and took her seat. After a couple of minutes of forced, awkward conversation between them, it was time to leave. I saw them get up to pay and walk out the door. I walked out past both of them and went straight to my car. I just watched them, making sure that she was okay. I couldn't hear anything they were saying, but I could tell she seemed to be fake smiling and trying to leave. She pulled out her phone and I saw him snatch it away. He held it up high in the air and was laughing at her as she tried to grab it back. He then started walking backwards towards a blue car that I assume was his. She wasn't smiling anymore and was clearly upset. I rolled down my window to listen since they were only a couple of car lengths away from me now. Stop playing around. Give me my phone back. Get in the car, Ivana. No, give me my phone back. Get in the car. Now. I saw she was crying and all I could think was that this had gone far enough. I jumped out of the car and I called my boyfriend. I walked straight towards them with my boyfriend on speakerphone and I yelled, give her the phone and get out of here. He seemed startled and he asked me who I was. Ivana was shaking at this point and all I could feel was rage. I'm her friend and I've been here the whole time. My boyfriend is on his way, and if you don't give her her phone back and get out of here before he gets here, then I swear to God, he is going to F you up. He handed her her phone back and started laughing. I was just joking. Jesus. And he got in his car and left. I finally calmed Ivana down and let her spend the night at my place. 
We thought about calling the police, but then we saw that he had deleted his Tinder account. I was upset that I didn't think to get his license plate. I'm not even sure that Omar was his real name. She told me that she paid for the hookah, so we don't even have his credit card info. I've learned a lot of things from scary situations in my life. And this one taught me that unless you know someone very well, always meet in public. And it never hurts to have a friend close by. This happened three years ago. I'm female, and at the time I was a 21-year-old university student. My parents lived in the same town as me, and my little sister was 15 at the time. I'd usually spend weekends at home. My country has an astronomical crime rate, especially when it comes to abductions and human trafficking. That being said, our town was considered one of the safer towns in my country. So over the weekends, usually on Saturdays, my sister and I would take a stroll to the nearby grocery store, buy some snacks and chill at the park nearby. Well, one Saturday after buying ice cream and snacks, we made our way to the park. The neighborhood was really quiet because it was a holiday weekend. We approached the swings when a strange man approached us. As soon as he spoke, I realized that he was a foreigner, or pretending to be a foreigner. He had a strange, forced accent, almost like he was trying too hard. And he was wearing really fancy clothes. It looked like he was heading to church or something. He introduced himself and said that he was working for an old lady that lived nearby. According to him, she made clothes for one of the primary schools in the area and she needed help with folding the clothes and packing them away. He said that she specifically asked for young girls to help out because she didn't trust boys and that she was willing to pay $25 for 45 minutes of work. I knew something was up. I'm not sure what $25 is to Americans, but for a young girl in my country, that's quite a lot. I thanked him for his generous offer, but declined. I said that we had to go home because my mom was waiting and she'd be worried if we weren't back on time. I then grabbed my sister's hand and tried to leave, but he stopped us and he shoved a pamphlet in my hand. I looked at it and it was an advertisement for the job he had just told us about, but the amount was obnoxiously plastered all over it and there wasn't an address or any details just a lengthy paragraph highlighting the requirements. Young girls. I noticed he was carrying an entire stack of these things, and it made me question his intentions even more. I told him again, No thank you, we're not interested and we really need to go home now. My senses started tingling and my mind was racing. I knew we were in big trouble and I had to get my little sister out of that situation. I looked around to see if I could find another adult that could help us out, but the streets were empty. I had to remain calm. I considered for a moment being more aggressive, but I didn't know if he was armed, and I didn't want to risk mine or my sister's safety. He was quite large and could have overpowered us both. Just when we were trying to leave, another lady conveniently appeared out of nowhere. She looked a lot older than me. I was initially relieved, but then he started telling her his line of BS and she ate it up. She sounded very interested, almost over eager. She looked at me and my sister and said, doesn't this sound like easy money? Before I could answer, the man said, you don't have to be afraid of me. I promise there's nothing to be afraid of. The old lady lives nearby, over there actually, and he pointed to a house diagonally across from where we were standing. She's very kind. Let's go talk to her so you can see that I'm not lying. I froze. 
we walked across the street. It was only a couple of steps away, but it seemed like it took forever. Time stood still. I'm not sure why I walked with them, but I remember feeling mechanical, like my mind was not able to process what was happening. We stopped at the gate and the man said, Now, this lady, she's very strict when it comes to safety. Before we go in, I need to know how much cash you're carrying. And I'll need your cell phones for the moment. She really dislikes technology. And if you're carrying any weapons, I need to keep those too, for safety reasons. My blood ran cold. I looked at the lady, and she handed her wallet and cell phone over. And she smiled and said, I'm not carrying any weapons. I was astonished at how she was able to trust him so fast. He looked at me and my sister, whom I had practically pushed behind me, and he said, Your turn now. I started slowly stepping backwards, smiling and said, Sorry, our dad is a local police officer, and if we're not home in ten minutes, our parents will go crazy, especially my dad because he's very protective. The man's demeanor changed in an instant. Oh, your dad works for the police? I kept walking backwards saying, Yes, he used to be in the army but he retired and now he's a cop. As soon as we were a safe distance away from them, we turned around and ran home. I tried taking out my phone and calling my mom, but I couldn't. I was shaking so badly. I only half made up the part about my dad being a local police officer. He is an ex-cop, not current, but I had to say something. As we were running, I looked back and I saw the man and the lady speed walking away from the old lady's house together. When we got home, I told my mother what happened. I started crying and my sister did too. My mom called my dad and he was there within minutes. My dad wanted to find this man. We looked throughout the neighborhood, but we couldn't find them. We called the police to file a report, but they couldn't do anything because they really hadn't done anything illegal. Fast forward a couple of months and abductions in our town suddenly skyrocketed. I don't know if it was related to our encounter, but it was still weird and unfortunate. I initially felt bad about leaving that other lady there, but looking back, I'm wondering if she wasn't an accomplice all along. It was very weird how she just handed over her wallet and cell phone without question, and then they walked away from this old lady's house, despite her acting very eager to get the job. Why didn't they go in? Yes, it seems a very good bet that they were working together. I'll never question my gut after that. So, possible human traffickers and abductors, let's not ever meet again. Please. The perpetrators in tonight's stories really need to be put in the trash, dragged to the end of the driveway, and left for the garbage truck to pick up. If you agree, give this video a thumbs up and comment below. Tell me which story disturbed you the most. I read every comment that you make, so don't think it will just sit there unread. This truly is an interactive channel. I call you my family of darkness for a reason. I love to interact with you all. So speak up and voice your opinion, and we'll have a nice conversation in the comments section. So, until next time, stay scared, my friends, and chatter away in the comments below.